Hi folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatorial. So I have spoken about this um, helmet before. This is a late 14th, early 15th century bassinet, and um, it commonly called a Hunskull or a pig face bassinet, various names they go by, but essentially it's a bassinet. This is the bassinet, incidentally. Bassinets can come with various types of visor, um, but the bassinet itself is dictated by the shape of this helmet, quite characteristic shape. Um, that was worn throughout the 14th century, um, but this type of visor really starts to appear commonly from about 1380 onwards, although they probably started to appear about 1370. Um, and I made some points previously talking about vision, breathing and hearing. These are often things that are overlooked when we talk about armour. Incidentally, some of you asked if I could put a camera inside here so you can see out of the visor and see what I'm seeing. I'm going to have a play around with that with my, um, with my action cam or my GoPro, um, my cheap version of a GoPro, and see if I can get that to work. Um, I'm not sure if it will work or not, but anyway, I'll have a try for you. Um, so a couple of other points that I wanted to talk about, about this type of helmet that often gets overlooked when we're talking about you know the development of armor and these sort of grand topics and kind of overview topics we often ignore some really important fundamentals when we're talking about armor so first of all I'm going to put the helmet on slightly easier to do if I put the uh, visor up you will notice there is no chin strap and I'm going to talk about that in a, a minute okay so it goes on fairly easily there we go dump it on the head and it's done. Okay, now you might think why has it got no chin strap? Well certain types of helmets that came along later, for example um, uh, Sallets um, or Sallet, depending how you want to say it, um, they very commonly do have chin, chin straps but they are much smaller helmets and usually lighter as well. Um, and because they sit higher on the head and finish higher up, and you'll know that of course with the Salette um, it generally has a, a bever for the lower half of the face, at least if you're going to fully armour up. If you're a more lightly equipped soldier such as an archer or a billman, um, then you just wear the, the Salette on the top of your head and not worry about the lower half of your head or your face. Um, but because it sits higher up, up on the head and is a generally smaller helmet and a generally usually lighter helmet, um, it requires a chin strap because a, a, a blow to the side could potentially remove it from the head or indeed if you just lean forward it might fall off the head. Now with a, with a bassinet like this, this goes much further down the head. You probably can't see because it's underneath the avantail which is the male over the padding that we've got here to protect the neck and chin uh, um, and round sides. The avantel actually overlays, um, overlaps rather, the plate underneath. But the plate actually comes all the way down to there. Okay, so if I actually tilt my head to the side, the um, plate of the helmet is resting on the top of my shoulder at that point. So it actually protects quite a long way down. And because the helmet, because my head is so deep into the helmet, it's actually quite difficult for it to be knocked off, for it, for it to accidentally come off my head. Um, so. The first point I really want to make is that bassinets, as far as we know, never had chin straps. I don't know, now correct me if I'm wrong, uh, there might be someone out there who's found some evidence in some manuscript illumination or something of one, but as far as I'm aware, you do not get chin straps on bassinets, largely because you don't really need them. Um, and there is another reason why you don't need that chin strap, and that is the weight of the helmet. Now. This is a point I want to talk about in regards to how a helmet works on your head. So most people think about armour as working because it um, forms a kind of force field around you, okay? The, a sword is never going to be able to cut through this hardened steel shell around my head, so therefore the sword can't offend my head. But then lots of people think one step further and think, oh well, you know, exchange of momentum if um, even if I've got the visor down and someone hits me with a, a lance in here, well, we've got glancing surfaces. So this is the this is the purpose of this type of helmet is that it's completely glancing and even around the eyes. If anything comes on here, it'll slide off. Um, whether it's arrows or lances or swords or whatever, um, I've got glancing surfaces. However. 
regardless of that, there is sometimes large forces that could hit me in the head. For example, a mace or a pole, pole axe, or indeed a lance if it hits square on. Um, if it hits there, for example, or in the side or in the back, um, or indeed um, if it manages to hit me from above, square on, down here, where all of the force will go into my head. Now, what happens at that point? You have to think then one stage further. Quite simply, that force gets transferred to the helmet first, okay? Now, the helmet is sitting on my head securely, okay? But when I do this and shake my head around, it does move a bit on my head. So the first thing is that the, the force, the energy from that, and I'm not gonna pretend that I'm a, uh, a physicist here, and I'm not gonna give a physics lecture, but in, I'm gonna talk in the most simple terms, the energy from that impact um, first of all, some of it is lost to glancing, technically some of it is lost to sound and other things, but um, a lot of the force will be uh, a lot of the time lost to glancing blows, but assuming it hits square on, the force goes into the helmet. Now the next thing that happens is the helmet moves on my head, okay? Now, that's actually really, really important. Um, and if we look inside historical helmets, and I'll take this off and show you inside this one in a minute, but if we look inside historical helmets, they are more, very often they're more similar to a builder's helmet than maybe something like a, than a boxing um, head guard, okay? In that, the helmet must be allowed to some degree to move on the head because this is very, very important for shock absorption, okay? Now, if I just take the helmet off for a minute, there we go, it's not that difficult to take it off. I can, oh my, everything's really loud now. <laughs> so we come back to the hearing point. It really, really, wearing medieval helmets really impedes your hearing. So I realize I'm talking a lot louder than I normally would, apologies for that. So inside here, what you might see, uh, I don't know if I'll be able to get the light. Maybe if I hold it, there we go, the light adjustment. So inside is a, I know the focus is not really liking this. There we go. There we go. You can maybe maybe get enough of the picture to be able to see what's on. But um, inside is padded, but it's not against the helmet, and that's the most important thing. The padding is around my head and is a kind of cradle away from the steel of the helmet. So we don't simply fill a steel helmet with foam, okay? That would actually mean that a lot of the force gets transferred directly to our heads. Now, um, I've not studied uh, brain injuries in boxing, but as I understand it, there are some people who believe that head guards worn in boxing can contribute to a greater degree of um, brain injury. Um, and the way that a boxing head guard is essentially right on the head is very, very different to a medieval helmet. A medieval helmet has a, a hard, heavy shell around a, essentially a floatable, movable inner. Okay, and that's very, very important for shock absorption. Now, the final thing I want to talk about that's really important to shock absorption, you'll notice when I move this thing around, it has a certain weight to it. I haven't actually weighed this, but I'm guessing it weighs probably about, uh, probably about six or seven pounds. That's my guess. It's about the same weight as a, yeah, it's a seven pound sledgehammer, I would think. It's definitely more than five pounds in weight. Okay, so that has a certain mass to it. Now, you might think that that's a disadvantage because, you know, you've got this mass on your head. And yeah, definitely it, it brings your center of gravity higher and means that you have to um, move a little bit differently. And when you get hit in the upper part, you have to react in a slightly different way to, to deal with the fact that you are now more top heavy than you normally would be. However, that weight is really important, and the main point I want to make is that mass in that helmet is part of what absorbs those heavy blows. So to a certain extent, you want a helmet that's likely to be hit by lances and pole axes and maces and things like this. You want it to be heavy, because the fact that the helmet is heavy helps uh, through exchange of momentum helps absorb some of that force from going into your head and into your neck. And your neck is very, very important because even if your head and your brain, your skull can take that blow, you're gonna get whiplash if you're gonna be hit repeatedly by pole axe in, in the side of the head. I'm just gonna put the helmet back on just because I feel like it. So 
In other words, when you've got this heavy object that can move slightly around on your head, okay, and the you've got padding, but the padding is away from the outer shell, what you end up with is a really, really good um, absorber of force, uh, of energy, okay? So, um, in other words, medieval people knew what they were doing. A heavy helmet with a floating system of padding inside, essentially a, cr a floating cradle inside, is a very, very efficient way of absorbing heavy blows from things like a lance or a mace or a poleaxe to your head. And it doesn't only protect your brain and your actual cranium, but it also protects your neck as well. And if you want to think about it in these terms as well, even if I'm not going to get a head or a neck injury, it also means that when someone swings a whopping great halberd or poleaxe at my head, assuming it doesn't break the helmet and go through the helmet, which usually it wouldn't, it also helps me to stay on my feet. Because if my, if my lower body was absorbing all of that shock, then I'd be knocked, knocked over, not sprawling on the floor really, really easily. So the fact that this is heavy and can move is really, really critical. Um, and that's not to say that all medieval helmets were heavy. Different helmets are designed for different jobs, but this type of helmet, specifically this and the great bassinet and you could say the armet, the later armet at least, um, and of course jousting helmets like the frog-mouthed helm and the earlier great helm. These helmets are designed to absorb and essentially absorb energy and protect you inside there and try and dissipate as much of that energy and prevent it from going into your body, either your head, your neck or your lower body. There we go folks, cheers. Thank you for watching, please subscribe, follow us on Facebook, you can buy t-shirts through Spreadshirt, support us on Patreon or follow us on Pinterest. Thank you.